This is FX Radio and I'm Andrew Whitfield-Cook. And with me on the line all the way from the UK is none other than Mike Ash, who is an osteopath and naturopath. He's also a clinical nutritionist and immunologist of some 30 years ex- um, experience. And over this time, he's built and sold one of the largest integrative health clinics in the UK. He's published innumerable papers, book chapters, and given seminars to over 20,000 clinicians on the role of mucosal immune system and its relationship to health. He's an author, researcher, and presenter with many uh, business development skills as well as clinical care. And he's also been an adjunct member of the Institute of Functional Medicine for a number of years. Welcome, Mike. Lovely to hear you. Good morning. Or good evening for you. And it's lovely to hear from you too. Mike, your lectures are foundational to the way that many practitioners think and practice because of how you treat from the ground up rather than symptomatically. Tell me about what you'll be talking on at the 2015 Biocidical Symposium and what can delegates expect to learn? Well, I think that there's some really fundamental elements that I'll be covering which relates to what you actually end up consuming. But the reasons why you choose that food to eat or that food supplement to consume is going to be explored in a a much greater level of detail, I think, than perhaps many would be familiar. We've been moving more and more towards this understanding that molecular tissue changes can be modified by food selection and lifestyle activity. And that if you understand some of the mechanisms that relate whether or not these changes are going to be helpful or non-helpful to you, then you can begin to unpick your patients or your clients' needs in a far more sophisticated way. But to do that requires uh, a pretty good understanding of some of the, what takes place in the mucosal immune system, which is the area, uh, as you alluded to, I spent much of my time uh, researching and working on. And Dietary impacts on health, it's probably one of the oldest concepts in medicine, Mm. uh, as I know you're very familiar, but it's only really in recent years, and by which I mean perhaps the last two decades, that technical advances in analysis, including mass spectrometry, uh, notobiology, and bacterial sequencing has enabled us to understand the role of our human physiology to progress to the point where we can really begin to isolate individual dietary components to affect specific illnesses. And so using specific dietary interventions gives us a really exciting potential for non-toxic physiological ways to alter the bacterial composition of our gastrointestinal tract, the related metabolic responses to those organisms, and then to alter and change the natural history of both intestinal or local damage and systemic disorders. Mike, it's, it's now thought that mitochondria have actually evolved from being a proteobacteria and Um, developed a symbiotic relationship with us, but it's now thought that their action is not just to provide us with ATP, but it has other actions as well. Is that right? I think if I can give you an example, uh, something that's a little little sort of catchy here is that I suspect most people listening to this, um, when we did their training, looked upon those ancient um, bacterial organelles that populate our cells, which are mitochondria, primarily is a mechanism to uh, deliver fuel or energy to our body in order that it may function and as a great reason to never look at the electron transport chain again. And what's become clear in the last few years is that these mitochondria have multiple roles to play, uh, not only in energy management but also in the innate immune system. And that's the ancient part of our immune system that comes to us hardwired when we're born. We inherit that. We don't have to train it. Mm. And more importantly, the mitochondria that reside both in the epithelial tissues and the associated local tissues related to immune response are now demonstrated to work in a bi-directional manner with the bacterial composition of your gut. So what does that mean? It means that if we end up with an unhappy or dysbiotic bacterial composition in the gut, we see a similarly reflected dysbiotic mitochondrial response in the local tissues and vice versa which means that these ancient bacterial epitope carrying organelles are recognized by the same receptors that recognize the organisms that live with us and share our moist and damp spaces so that 
if they become disrupted, they have the capacity to become a systemic, chronic inducer of low-grade pathological inflammation that migrates from the gastrointestinal tract systemically through to other organ tissues in the body. This is a very exciting uncoupling of some of the understandings because I think uh, you and I would both be able to say with a degree of confidence that if we make someone's gastrointestinal tract work more efficiently, we'll often see a wide range of improvements occurring across their body. Mm. And for a lot of people, that's enough. But for me, it was always a case of, well, why do some people show much better responses than others? What else is occurring? How can we amplify that process? And how can we make that person recover more efficiently? And I sort of summarize this up by saying, identifying the best target for a heterogeneous collection of patients in whom diverse immunopathogenic mechanisms have been activated requires a multi-layered and iterative strategy to achieve safe, effective outcomes. And that means that we have to do many things simultaneously, repeatedly. And once you understand why and how you can communicate that with the patient that you're working with mm. and direct your responses at a molecular response, you can really step away with a much higher level of success and can manage those complex patients which fill our lists every day with a much higher level of confidence and better outcomes. Dysfunctional mitochondria are a hallmark of a host of diseases from chronic fatigue to cancer. So what you're saying is that even by delivering targeted nutrition to the mitochondria, that you can affect not just energy-centered disorders that we've, you know, that we're familiar with, but even gut-based disorders. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. And you, you hit it. And the very first thing you said, you hit it on the head. It's without question, perhaps the most interesting area in molecular medicine, which is how do we get de novo synthesis of mitochondria? How do we manage to tidy up damage in ancient mitochondria? And how do we manage to extend the useful lifespan of the mitochondria that we have? Those are the three components that researchers around the world are working on. And there are some natural agents that can do that, and there are some natural lifestyle changes that can do that. Individually, they have limitations, but when they become part of an iterative strategy, you can have manifestly better outcomes around a wide range of conditions. And part of what uh, uh, Dr. Houston has been uh, working hard with us to try to explain is that there is an infinite range of insults that mm. can adversely affect an individual's health, but there's a finite number of responses as either, these are, don't have to happen independently, of course, but it's oxidative stress, inflammation, yeah. and immune dysfunction. Yeah. And the mitochondria sit right at the nexus of that multiple amplifying mechanism. So, I'm going to show you how you can use gastrointestinal immunology to enhance mitochondrial de novo synthesis, reduce inappropriate collapse of mitochondria, and consequently reduce activation of the innate immune system, reduce oxidative stress, and reduce inflammation as part of the story about how and why using the gastrointestinal tract as a point of intervention for a safe uh, treatment provide you opportunity for multiple organ system uh, resolution at the same time. So you've done some interesting research with Professor Garth Nicholson on this on mitochondrial energy, haven't you? Tell me about, what you, tell me about what you discovered. Well, we did a big review um, <clears throat> for uh, a major uh, science journal last year. And uh, part of that span out of some work that uh, Professor Nicholson did back in 1972 where he and a colleague identified the um, fluidity that's present in uh, molecular membranes, and they asked him to do a 40-year review. And as part of that, we were asked to put together where we feel the story about um, molecular structures of both mitochondria and cell membranes relate to this increasingly chronicity, this increasing chronicity of illnesses that we see. Mm -hmm. So we explore the use of um, a number of ways of nutrient concentrations and a special form of lipids, which we've done 11 studies on now, showing how these lipids repair both the inner membrane of mitochondria and therefore reduce cardiolipin oxidation. Mm. 
And then as a result, there's a molecular switch which sits inside uh, our cells called the inflammasome. It's a bit of a funny old name, but it just means inflammation of the whole body, so inflammation soma. And there are a number of these, but there's one in particular that's very interesting, uh, and particularly interesting for the, the talk we're going to be having, which is called NLRP3. And mitochondria, if they are oxidized, damaged, or leak, so the membranes become uh, less capable of maintaining an appropriate electric charge, contribute to the switching on of these inflammasomes. And once they do that, they turn on an enzyme which uh, manifestly creates two very potent cytokines called interleukin-1 and interleukin-18. So we began to look at whether or not mitochondria act as an historical defense mechanism to eradicate pathogens such as yeast bacteria and fungi and viruses become inadvertently switched on by a bacterial historical epitope present in mitochondria that are forced into a state of damage, which are called damps or damage associated molecular patterns yep. because of changes in bacterial composition in the gastrointestinal tract. So we began to feed back this loop. Now, it wasn't just us. There were a number of researchers around the world that were also teasing out uh, this relationship. And about two years ago, we published our first paper hypothesizing this. And then we wrote this big review paper last year, which has attracted a lot of um, uh, other researchers, we've had a lot of citations from that. And what it's showing is that there's this bidirectional relationship between our history, that which we've inherited over millennia, and the relationship to our gastrointestinal tract that we abuse these days by changes of food selection, inappropriate food selection, etc. And nestling in between those, uh, Andy, between those two t uh, messages, the bacterial composition and the intracellular switches, is the mucosal immune system. It acts as a buffering agent, it acts as a message carrier, and it acts as a restoration opportunity. So going back to that first sentence, which is we need a multi-layered iterative strategy to achieve a safe, effective outcome, brings us back to that old concept, which is the idea of holism, that if we think of somebody as having multiple events occurring simultaneously, but we only target one that mm. happens to suit our personal understanding, the outcomes are going to be less consistent than if we open our comprehension, think collectively using that functional medicine model, which I know you're familiar with, and target multiple tissues at the same time. Let's talk about microbial metabolic fitness. What does the latest research show us? One of the uh, spin-outs from all of this is the recognition that mitochondria receive signals from the caloric intake of the food that we have. And the spill out from that is that mitochondria become, <coughs> excuse me, one of the ways in which our metabolic functionality deteriorates. So whether we say it's a typically type 2 diabetes, whether we say it's cardiovascular disease, as I know uh, Dr. Houston will cover, or whether it's central nervous system affect, metabolic dysfunction uh, has a direct relationship to mitochondrial function. Mm. And metabolic fitness is uh, a reflection of mitochondrial fitness. And as we age, I know you're only a young man, but as you approach those uh, declining years, this is the sort of information that you'll grasp uh, to your chest with a lot of enthusiasm, which is that if you ironically starve your mitochondria, if you deny them access to any food, they become more robust mm. for a period of time. Mm. If you deny them food for too long, eventually they will start to disintegrate. And the skill has been trying to work out what type of caloric restriction, what type of patterning works most effectively, and secondly, what type of food to follow up that period of restriction provides your mitochondria and your metabolism with the best chance of maintaining a non-inflammatory and a beneficial state. So I'm going to be describing how different types of studies, mainly in mouse models, but mm. increasingly in human studies now, show that the way that you advise people to choose timings for food, as well as types of food, can really add some fuel to your outcome. So this is talking about fasting and refeeding with regards to dampening or, or, or reducing autophagy, is that right? It's a question of both um, inducing and 
reducing inappropriate autophagy. Right. So but the, the, the way that we tidy up mitochondria has its own little name. It's called mitophagy. Oh. And so in order that the enzymatic clearance of ancient mitochondria is done efficiently, requires uh, us to utilize parts of mitochondria to inculcate those into their allies, the mitochondria that are not yet at the point where they've become irrecoverable and utilize that a bit like a recycling system. Mm. But if that recycling is being restricted because the way that we remove the particulates has become compromised, yep. it's a bit like your back garden. It gets filled with rubbish, where yeah. opposed to being taken away efficiently. And, for example, time-restricted feeding is one of the ways of exploring um, nutrient imbalance, you know, where people eat inappropriately for periods of time. And the hardest battle, I think you'll recognize this, uh, as all of us that are in practice do, is no matter how positive and um, enthusiastic you might be as the person who recommends a lifestyle change to your poorly and in, uh, poorly and compromised human, it has to be translatable. It has to be something that they can fit mm. into their life in such a way that it becomes repetitive. Yeah and uh, something that they enjoy. Mm. And so we've been looking around, uh, I know uh, Garth and I have been looking at this for some time now, looking at what type of um, way that you can advise people based on solid evidence as well as uh, outcomes that we watch to see how would you choose a technique of feeding that improves metabolic fitness via microbial and mitochondrial fitness. And that includes periods of not eating, and perhaps the best way of saying this at the moment, one of the most interesting ones is that you don't eat except within an established eight-hour period during the week. So you have eight hours uh, when you can eat to a degree uh, as much as you wish, but outside that eight-hour period, you don't eat, but you can consume liquids. Yep. Now, the mouse models that are running on this look very impressive. Uh, the human studies are about to get underway, but you know, for something as well as I do, that um, retaining life in a worm by denying it food is a pretty persuasive argument if you want to be a long-lived worm, but it's not terribly convincing if you want to be a long-lived human. You have to make that process practical. Sorry, sorry, but in some of the yeah. primate um, primate work was also a little bit disappointing too, wasn't it? Yeah, mm. and there's, there's no doubt no one has the entire answer. The overarching statement you can make is that overeating tends to increase morbidity, mm. reducing total food intake whilst maintaining appropriate nutrient density across all mammals seems to demonstrate improved metabolic fitness and uh, enhance uh, quality of life for longer. And we see the opposite in clinic most of the time. We see people that are overeating. Yeah, uh, and uh, doing everything they can to bring their quality of life uh, to a close rather than doing all that they can to stretch that out to give them a, a much greater potential for longer. Mike, this smacks true of those clinicians that might be incorporating detoxification practices with their patients. And I, I've got to say, I do feel that a lot of people don't do detoxification well. That Can you please... Tell me about how important it is to first rejuvenate the gut before attempting any detoxification. Well, you're right uh, in that there's often an enthusiasm to assist elimination ahead of restoration. Mm. And it's probably one of those decisions that are often made because, I would say, protocol-driven clinical care makes life much easier, but it fails to recognize most of the time the individuality needs or the individual needs of the person you're seeing. I know yeah. my colleague, uh, Dr. Pizzorno, has um, got a lot of information around toxic insults and how the gastrointestinal tract is such an important part of the way that we neutralize those risks and eliminate them. And I would reinforce that by saying that if you ask somebody to give up agents that they have worked very hard to store in an attempt to protect themselves from that agent. If we then say, let's stimulate various 
bioremediation pathways by increasing the availability of key nutrients necessary to make those enzymes work more efficiently. But we don't have a reasonably robust immune and bacterial composition inside the gastrointestinal tract, which is where the majority of this will end up. Some of it naturally will be sweated, breath, or mm. come to the kidneys, but the majority of it's going to end up in the gut. If we mm. create a disturbance in that already compromised bacterial community, the systemic messages that that challenge then induces can be catastrophic. Mm. And it's not good enough for the clinician to say, this is a healing climax or a Herxheimer response and hang in there, you'll get through with it. It fails to understand and articulate appropriately the care necessary to achieve a safe, effective detoxification. And it sometimes means that protocol therapy has overridden conscious decision-making by listening to the patient describe to you what they want. Mm. <laughs> and so I say that your bacterial companions, the mucosal immune system, should be assessed prior to anybody undertaking either a fasting-induced detoxification or a bioremediation-induced combination of fasting and specific foods designed to aid that process to take place. Mm. Tell me about the latest research with the diversity of the human gut microbes. We thought initially there were like three core biomes, but more recent work shows that we're all very different with regards to gene, culture, diet, and drug intake and stresses, etc. Tell me what's going on. I think that what we're probably seeing is more and more money is poured into this. Um, I think you and I talked about this almost probably a decade ago, and um, there was a great awareness that we had an increasingly wide variety of organisms, and certainly that's both geographical, uh, it's certainly familial, and to some degree, there's an hereditary component to the bacterial composition that you share uh, your life with. And then we do our very best during most of our decision makings to give that organism, that organ, that com composition, enough challenges that we artificially either diminish its diversity. Mm -hmm. and I think this is perhaps uh, an easy concept for people to understand is that the more diverse your bacterial composition is, the greater resilience you have against insult. Mm -hmm. The less diverse, and whilst it's very tempting to think of those three primary phyla groups as simplifying the organ, it's just not good enough to really account for what takes place. But the less diverse you have, you find that relationship with inflammatory bowel disease, dysfunctional gut problems, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, central nervous system affect, uh, risk for autoimmune inflammation, etc. Mm. So we say that if you take a lovely rainforest, in very simple terms, and you chop out a dozen or so species, there's enough redundancy in the rest of the uh, rainforest to not really have much of a, uh, a consequence. But if by circumstance you take out 100 or 200 or maybe 1,000 different species, yeah. and so you reduce down to a few core organs, organisms, you become less and less efficient at coping with the stresses, and the manifestation of that is always the same. It's either going to be oxidative stress, immune dysfunction, or inflammation, or typically all three. I've heard you speak about the therapeutic use of helminths or worms in therapy before. What does the latest research show, and how does this tie into the concept of um, you know, our diversity and certainly favouring dendritic cell tolerance? Most, most people these days in the Western world, and that'd be the same for Australia as it is for the UK and the US, have by circumstance become uh, islands that rarely experience the uh, benefits of sharing uh, mild to moderate pathogenic organisms inside their gastrointestinal tract, uh, particularly those classified under the, the terminology as a helminth. And that's been a great benefit for the majority of people because helminths aren't uh, in the main benign. They uh, induce fairly aggressive defense mechanisms and you feel pretty rough. But there are three um, that have been explored now for over a decade um, that are seen as organisms that are transient or temporary occupiers of the gastrointestinal tract. Mm. 
that in the time that they're there, stimulate a phenotypical expression of our T helper cells that favors an anti-inflammatory response. So um, Trichuus suis, which is a pig whipworm, which Joel Weinstock identified, I think probably 13 years ago now, in a subset of patients with non-responding colitis, tied together some epidemiology, some gastrointestinal immunology, and some basic immunology, and took a chance and thought, if I introduce this um, worm into these individuals, Mm. Would the relationship between the immune system recognizing the patterns present on this worm and the induction of what we believe is an anti-inflammatory response because these worms have learned over millennia to artificially suppress our immune system in order that they're not rejected, Hmm. would that confer a benefit? And the answer to that was it did. And that started the process. Uh, We then had a group out of the UK using Necator Americanus, which is a... Um, transient organism uh, found in indigenous populations around the world and uh, out of Nottingham University in the UK they've been pursuing that for a decade as well. Now these haven't translated into mainstream therapy but the third option was that you took patterns that is um, molecular structures derived from these organisms and then you introduce those as a capsule partly because people get a bit uncomfortable about either swallowing or having uh, one of these organisms introduced into their bloodstream. Um, and that that research is, is continuing. And yeah. so I think it's, it's it's definitely playing around this whole idea that we have a switch or a number of switches that we can turn on or off. And that part of that process, we developed over tens of thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years, mm. both to be an advantage to us and these organisms have developed it to be an advantage for them. Yeah. Um, it's interesting to me that the the proposed development or evolution of IgE was to help in the in the control of helminth infections and that since the Detol generation, dare I use that term, um, we've lost that control and hence it might be one of the uh, reasons that um, allergies are through the roof. Yeah, look, the, um, the idea that environment changes both externally and internally um, create a lack of appropriate control over inherited, highly sophisticated mechanisms that we've employed for hundreds of thousands of years mm. to survive our environmental challenges, I think has a great deal of credibility. And Graham Rook, who's a retired professor of immunology in the UK, uh, has spent a great deal of time. In fact, they were on the BBC. I mean, I, I just, I'm always uh, um, fascinated by how, how the non-professional public are educated by people who've been talking about this for 15 or 16 years because even for a clinician, this is quite, particularly when we get down to more detail, this is quite a sophisticated and complicated area to understand well, albeit that the treatment, everyone can take a breath in here, the treatment's relatively simple. Mm. But knowing which one to give and when and for how long means you have to understand uh, at least reasonably well your mechanisms. And Graham puts it together very, very well. And uh, that whilst we're tempted to think that it's an external manifestation, or, or sorry, an internal manifestation of an external cleansing, i.e. that we've, as you say, dettled or sterilized our environment, yeah. it is the loss of diversity, the loss of our old friends, yeah. the loss of organisms which we spent generations living with that have more impact. The human microbes embed in the mucous membranes of the gut and they talk to us through that. But it's not as simple as just saying mucus. We've got different types of mucus. And you'll be speaking on this, won't you, about the use of mucins as a therapy? Yeah, I mean, you're almost right there. The, it's, the bacteria in our, in our gut shouldn't have a direct contact with epithelial tissue. No, they no, should no. be they embed in the mucus. prevented from doing so yeah. by these either single or double layered mucins, which have different genetic uh, composition. And uh, I think mucins have been missed out as a therapeutic tool um, over the last few years. People have concentrated more on other aspects, but it's quite clear that mucin production, mucin quality, 
and to that extent mucin density, is an important in the immunological part of our defense. Not as a benign gloop, but as a way in which we allow ourselves to communicate effectively between the bacteria and these epithelial cells, which in epithelial cells are not simply uh, barrier cells. They're also immune uh, receivers and immune translators. Mm. So if we have, uh, say, a typical patient presents with a functional gut problem, and one of the characteristics is episodic diarrhea, uh, which may include uh, transient mucins present, so they see white stringy mass uh, in their stool samples, not bleeding, but just white stringy mass. Yep. The temptation is, oh, I've got too much mucus. Well, mucus is both a defensive mechanism, it's pumped out, uh, which is an expensive exercise, it takes a lot of energy to do that, to wash away, and that's probably the way most clinicians see this, as a mechanism for facilitating an eradication. Mm -hmm. Whereas what's quite clear is that if you have a healthy composition of certain types of bacteria, which can best be amplified by a food selection rather than an oral ingestion, then they communicate with the epithelial cells, the panis cells, and the goblet cells to produce lovely, healthy, fresh mucins, which in turn mean that we can induce tolerance and a collective bacterial composition that favors metabolic fitness and microbial diversity. And food selection uh, is the primary way that we can favor Acomancia mucinophilia, which is the best, most understood hmm. microbe to stimulate that production. So this is the work of Clara Belter and, and others in the group? Yeah, yeah. and uh, she, she's very, it's mainly in mass models uh, at the moment, but uh, there was a very nice piece in um, the British Medical Journal last year saying that from a gastroenterology perspective that mucins have long been uh, ignored by pretty much all clinicians as a therapeutic target and that we should be focusing on that. And this paper went on to say, but um, as yet, we don't know the best way to do this. And I'm thinking, well, here's a clinician that's grasped the concept, but isn't reading the data. Mm. We do have a pretty good way. We do know how to do this. And that's by encouraging our patients to choose the right type of food and the right type of uh, soluble or insoluble fiber that favors the organisms necessary to break down mucins as they become aged to stimulate um, goblet cells to manufacture more. Can, can we also uh, use certain uh, monosaccharides or polysaccharides to influence these mucins? Things like mannose and neuraminic acid, fucose, all of those, these monosaccharides, that they gained notoriety around about a decade ago and they've sort of fallen yeah, by the wayside of it. You're right. And I think that fiber, in its broadest sense, mm -hmm. has definitely has periods where it, the sun sets on it and other periods where it becomes a little bit more fashionable again. Yeah. And uh, identifying individual fibrous content, I think it's probably more interesting to clinicians because it sounds like there's a little bit more understanding about it. But fundamentally... We're looking to favor food groups that contain different aspects of fibrous constitution, which the acidic environment of our colon relishes the opportunity to dis dismember those foods mm. and utilizes them, not only for their own self-reproduction, uh, but also for quite sophisticated immune-enhancing components. And once we recognize that the decision about what we place on the fork and place it then in our mouth reflects 30 feet later in a very complex tube as to how that translates over months and weeks and years into health and the recovery from illness. So the, have you heard about the FODMAP diet? It's gained notoriety, sure. certainly with gluten intolerance, oh, forgive me, celiac disease and uh, potential gluten intolerance, certainly irritable bowel syndrome. How does that mesh when you're talking about trying to feed certain polysaccharides, oligosaccharides, when these might be causing symptoms? I think there's two points for me to just sort of give you a little bit of focus here. One is I think that if we say a FODMAP low diet yep. or a low FODMAP diet, yep. it's effectively an exclusionary diet. I don't think there's anybody 
hope that um, is probably listening, taking the time out to listen to this podcast that hasn't either thought or applied some form of exclusionary diet with the patients they look after. Mm-hmm. Dietitians, and I don't mean to create a sort of a separate camp so far, but I think there has been a great sense that exclusionary diets are perhaps faddish, that they haven't really had a great deal of data on them, yet we see time and time again that if we exclude certain primary food groups from our patients, that there's a significant improvement in their health, and a great number of them, not all of them, but a great number of them. So I think there's a degree of politicization around the low FODMAS diet. I hear something that can be held tight to the chest of the dietetic community as a legitimated food exclusion diet, and that the functional gut problem that you alluded to does seem to have some merit in it, as does small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. But the problem with all exclusionary diets is that they are, by virtue of their presentation, protocol-oriented. That is that you say you have a diagnosis, whoever makes that determination, and ergo, everyone must be the same because you only have to give the same strategy and they'll feel better. Whereas what we're saying is that certain types of food really don't suit people with certain conditions most of the time, but not all of the time. Mm. And so making that determination to say, here's my patient with complex immunopathogenic mechanism disruption, for which I'm going to artificially ask them to follow a program of exclusion based on a study of similar people, and I'm going to see what happens. And that's maybe a perfectly reasonable start point for many. But of course, I recommend foods which, for example, have aryl hydrocarbon receptor and agonistic capability, which enhances the induction of specialized immune cells in the gastrointestinal tract, which if you were following the FODMAP diet accurately, you wouldn't eat. Mm. Yet I would say that we see patients time and time again for which they absolutely need to eat those foods ahead of any exclusionary diet because unless we repair and induce increased production of these immune cells, they're never going to get better, whether they follow a FODMAP or a gluten-free, or assuming they're not CDAC, for example, yeah. or other type of exclusionary diet. But that decision really becomes apparent during the case history and the careful analysis and obviously some subsequent testing. I, I think so you... I think the temptation to say, I have a solution from me or anybody else. Here's my solution. You'll see I don't do or discuss protocols. We discuss mechanisms and whilst we give strong indications as to how to interpret somebody in that background of understanding the mechanisms and we recommend certain well understood options of treatment we don't just say if someone presents with x you give them y Mm. because it 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 doesn't imply personalization it doesn't imply appropriate listening and it doesn't give you the success ratio to failure that you really need Mm. um I've got to say, I agree with you. I'm, I'm not against the FODMAP. I think it's certainly got uh, merit, certainly in certain populations. But my question is, would if you're going to exclude these major sort of healthy food groups, wouldn't you only do that while you are healing the gut until such point as you can then re-challenge? Always. I think um, we should offer our, our patients an opportunity to recover some of their lost foods mm. because... I think there's so much opportunity for individuals to read around the subject now than there was 20 years ago. So 20, 25 years ago, really what I held in my head was stuff that you couldn't acquire because the internet didn't exist. (laughs) There is so much opportunity for people to discover things now that they'll often come Mm. prepped up with some ideas. But generally speaking, we, all of us tend to see people who are more complicated than they can individually solve or inadvertently they've made themselves worse. And, that's often because they followed um, non-specific dietary exclusionary diets and they've become nutrient deficient or they've become isolated within their family structure or they've become an impossible person to spend any social time with so they become isolated within their community, all of which have significant risk factors for failure for that individual to recover. So, yes, piecing together a program of recovery which allows 
translation of their needs together with where you need to intervene is really what our role is these days and understanding what tools are available and which ones are most suitable and when to apply them doesn't occur over a two-hour lecture that takes time and effort and uh, willingness to invest experience but once it begins to fall into place it becomes as you'll discover over these three days not just from me but from uh, my colleagues that are speaking is that there's so much continuity between each of the ways that we communicate the message that we hope everyone leaves with a much higher level of confidence that they can start very logically and build themselves up and obviously apply this to the clinic, to the uh, clinical needs of the patients they see. Mm. Mike, you've had a keen interest for many years in treating autism and autism spectrum disorders. Can you give the listeners, and I know this is a 12-hour subject, but can you give the listeners some key points regarding diet and supplementation? Um, 20 years ago, um, I got involved in my very first unwanted and unappreciated case of uh, somebody who'd been given a diagnosis of autism, and that, to be honest, I knew virtually nothing about it. Mm. Uh, and I immersed myself in this world uh, for over a decade. And in particular, part of what we've been talking about became increasingly clear as we did research work and followed our patients at the time that, that we see that within the autistic community, a large number, not everybody, a large number have, at least as a major driver, a part of their symptomology, a loss of mucosal immune tolerance inside the gastrointestinal tract. More so, I would say, as a point of relevance than any gene mm. uh, abnormality. And in particular, it's possible to influence relevant genes by changing um, composition of bacteria and immune chemical production inside the gastrointestinal tract anyway. But the two things I think that I, I perhaps can give most confidence with is that you don't have to be highly complex when you start with somebody in uh, spectrum. And typically, we would mostly work with children mm. who are being guided by their carer, which is their parents. So a simple model to keep in mind is what can we remove from this individual's exogenous risk factors, includes their environment and their food and whatever medication or, or supplements they're typically taking, that would facilitate a greater sense of capability for them. And what do we need to add to reinforce that? Sid Baker's old analogy, what do we need to take away and what do we need to remove? And there are common things. One is that Paul Shattuck's work and Carl Reichelt's work and a variety of other people show that a lot of these people find that uh, gluten-containing foods or grains and uh, casein and dairy-containing foods are worth exploring as an exclusion. Hmm. Uh, for a period of time. Thirdly, that essential fatty acids, particularly um, fish oils that contain retinoic acid or vitamin A, are usually helpful. And it's a very neat little thing here is that Mary Megson showed, I think 12 years ago now, Mary and I did a series of presentations at least 12 years ago, showing that um, G-alpha receptors in the uh, back of the retina are higher responsive to cis retinol. And that we see a lot of people bringing in their children who were unable to take a direct eye contact, which is terribly distressing for the parents. Yeah. It seems less troubling for the child. Yeah. But Mary identified that cis retinoic acid, and my work with uh, vitamin A metabolism and gene receptors being uncoupled with vitamin A deficiency, uh, fitted in with this story, and if you give fish oil that contains a small dose of cis retinol within two to three weeks, most of these children will be able to look at you straight on. Now, whilst that may not ultimately uncouple them from any significant diagnostic criteria, hmm. it made a huge difference to the hmm, relationship to the family, that yeah. emerged between the parents. Yeah. Absolutely. And so, so that was so we used to just simply exclude foods that were known to be triggers, try and increase diversity within the capabilities of taste, texture, time, and management for somebody who's often lost uh, a great deal of interest mm. in willingness to eat different types of foods. Mm. Improve mucosal immune response by measuring secretory IgA, which is relatively simple. We can do that with a salivary test. And increase microbial diversity, which 
comes around to bacterial supplementation initially and uh, then inhibit in addition what i used to work mainly was in addition nf kappa b but nf kappa b is uh, one step up from the inflammasome these days inflammasome activation in autistic uh, cases is receiving a lot of interest mm-hmm. there's a number of papers already published and there's a i know there's a whole bunch of research exploring this area and that comes back to that thing we talked about right at the very beginning mitochondrial fitness yeah so and moving on from there you know recent work suggests that bacteria our microbes may influence even conditions such as stress and depression in non-autistic people um or um, asd people so we know that the gut makes neurotransmitters bacteria metabolize nutrients to precursors of neurotransmitters but do you think we'll ever reach a stage where microbes are used to treat conditions like depression or anxiety? We're already there. Psychobiotics, which is the current parlance to describe a selection of organisms specifically to enhance the inhibition of interleukin-1 and interleukin-18 via inflammasome uh, suppression, yep. are already being trialed. Oh, wow. And I... I think, what was it, 11, 12 years ago, uh, I came to do a couple of uh, lecture tours for you guys in, in Australia. And back then, I was describing how we were using organisms to change cytokine receptors in the central nervous system by indirect activation of vagal nerve um, triggering. So whilst there's a direct neurotransmitter and metabolite change that can take place in the gastrointestinal tract, which manifestly provides systemic benefits. One of the really quick ways of changing people's mind responses or mood responses is by changing induction of cytokine populations inside the gastrointestinal tract that bind to receptors on the vagal nerve which facilitates a transmission of that message through the blood-brain barrier to bind to the same receptors in the central nervous system. So this was understood um, 8 to 10, possibly 12 years ago, and that's continued to evolve. So I think very quickly we're going to be seeing that it won't be the Prozac story, which is failed, as we know, quite miserably through um, longitudinal studies to be of little benefit except in cases of quite severe depressive behavior, that the whole concept of single neurotransmitted dysfunction is failing to really sustain itself in the face of increased understanding. Is it, yeah, psychobiotics, psychofood choices, which is either we're choosing food to favor these, lifestyle changes, and where appropriate, use of uh, single or multiple drug interventions are going to become a recognized, iterative, safe, multi-layered strategy to help people recover from persistent, difficult to manage and mood disorders. So two quick questions just to finish up. And the first one relates to a herb or a herbal compound that we've used in treating depression and things like that. And it's tie in with gut and that's curcumin. What role do you think Mm -hmm. curcumin plays in this? The the, the real joy of humans is that in order to survive as long as we have, we've built into all of our tissues an incredible capability of utilizing multiple signals uh, in the space of both overabundance and underabundance. No two indigenous populations consume exactly the same diet. So we've acquired a huge capability of extracting from certain food compounds vital elements that facilitate our longevity. Then we spent the last 50 or 60 years beating up that incredible diversity to make sure that we favor agro and petrochemical industry selected six or seven primary foods. Mm -hmm. Then we say, well, God, we're missing something's missing, let's go and find a single component of which curcumin, tremendously researched, lots of potential benefits. But essentially what we're saying with curcumin is here is an anti-inflammatory. It has multiple points of intervention. It changes multiple different pathways, but in fundamental, we're targeting that primary component of those finite responses, which is inflammation, which in turn switches off some of the immune dysfunction, which in turn reduces oxidative stress. Hmm. So where we say we have 
unlimited insults, but finite responses. The temptation is to look for solutions to those finite responses. And right at the very beginning, I said we have to have a multi-layered iterative strategy, which includes removing some of those insults, for which curcumin on its own as a suppressor of the insult has a limited long-term capabilities. Yep. But without doubt, as part of our overall work, a very reasonable and safe herb to include. Mm. Here, here, I, I think we're too often we're uh, beguiled into using single bullet or the you know silver bullet therapy, and it just doesn't work when you're talking about a complex nature of a patient. Absolutely right. I mean, we've been seduced, uh, even you, and I know you can generally resist all types of seduction, but we've been seduced over half a century into believing that there is a simple solution to a complex problem. We like the idea; it, it appeals to us. Um, but we're losing very quickly that relationship except in acute or certain types of infectious disorders. And uh, as the World Health Organization points out, 70% of morbidity and morbid associated deaths in the whole world relate to chronic non-infectious or non-communicable diseases. And they really, there is no simple solution. There mm. is no one point of intervention. Yeah. And, and just sort of combining the uh, treatment, the, or the, forgive me, the microbial treatment for depression, combining that with curcumin and certainly other, you know, fatty acids and, and things like that. But it's use with atypical depression. I've heard you talk about this and it's got some key differences with other types of depression. Can you briefly just outline what atypical depression is and maybe give us some key insights into how you might treat it? Sure. Um, differentiating the classes of depression is something that keeps psychiatrists occupied uh, a great deal. But atypical depression are people that are individuals that left the... It's a simple example. If you leave them alone, they won't tend to be spontaneous inducers of exciting activity. But if you were to prepare, stimulate, and drag them along, they actually become alive and become quite good at communicating and engaging with you. But the effort involved in constantly lifting them up is a sort of something that most people recognize. You have to invest mm. quite a bit of energy. You know, people like to say that there's a transfer of energy, but mostly what you're trying to do is activate a series of responses in that person that once they begin to get some momentum, they tend to feel better. But once they're taken away from that stimulus, uh, they drift back into a, like a flat state of um, functionality. They don't easily get excited but they're not at the same time somebody that's particularly productive. They also have habits that tend to favor towards eating disorders. They particularly enjoy um, food stimulants. So uh, cook, um, chocolate is a, a very common consumer. And they'll often describe muscle fatigue that when they go to walk upstairs, the legs feel very heavy and uh, difficult to move. They tire quite quickly. Uh, yet, give them the right stimulation, you think there's nothing wrong with this person at all. They seem quite normal. Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> this is a, uh, a type of depression where we have what appears to be a very small bridge between them being quite a uh, communicative, adaptive, and responsive member of the community and somebody that's reclusive and insular and prone to addictive behavior and not showing much in the way of uh, physical capability. And so I did some studies on this back in, I think it was 2008, 2009, uh, where we showed the interleukin uh, one again <clears throat> and... Uh, Interleukin-10, which is a defensive mechanism uh, produced to control inflammation, could be stimulated through the use of lactic acid bacteria. And a, com a combination of um, what we call the meaning response, Andrew, which is really where we um, provide an explanation, an understanding, and a treatment program that the individual we're treating buys into. And I don't mean that they become they're willing to buy their timeshare on the west coast of Australia. What I mean is that we create an a intellectual and emotional understanding which facilitates part of their own healing to begin, together with some very practical interventions, uh, food modifications, some organisms that they consume, and uh, some targets that we aim for. Uh, we can facilitate a great number of these individuals to self-recover without the need for... Um, the induction of pharmaceuticals. Right. It doesn't mean to say that sometimes pharmaceutical care isn't run alongside because they, it is. Mm. Often they come to me when they're already on prescription, but we look to help them move off that over time. Yeah. 
And so the atypical depressive patient, uh, it's not going to be a big feature of my talk, but uh, I have written a number of pieces on that. Uh, but yes, it follows the same model. We can spin, I don't mean this in a political way, but we can spin the understanding of dysfunctional gastrointestinal immune functionality across every non-infectious, non-communicable disease that we'll see in clinical practice to some degree of credibility from a very high relationship to at least a reasonably well understood associative relationship in which there is still benefit in making use of it. Mike, I could talk to you for hours about your wealth of information and clinical practice. It, it, it's really exciting that you're coming out, I've got to say, um, to visit us again in the 2015 symposium. I can't wait to see you again. So I look forward to seeing you there and I look forward to uh, what uh, clinical pearls we can glean off you then. Andrew, thank you very much as always for um, making the effort to phone me up at this very early hour in the UK <laughs> and uh, to uh, have this conversation. I look forward to seeing you and uh, all of your colleagues and the attendants uh, to this great uh, symposium that I know you guys are putting together and I hope that everyone that can will come and uh, enjoy the event. Thanks Mike. This is FX Radio. I'm Andrew Whitfield-Cook.